I cried. Did anyone else get really speechless because a poem touched them? This touch is to the depth of my soul every time I listen. I cried, not because I'm bullied, but because this was something beautiful. I listen to this poem whenever I'm lost. Welcome to this episode of Out Loud, Break the Chain on Bullying. Here at Out Loud, we believe that poems can help create a more inclusive community. Few people can claim the mantle of poet, but all people have poems within them. I'm Adele Houston, and I'm your MC today. And joining me in the studio are two persons interested in the topic of poetry and bullying. My name is Jennifer Nolan. I am a poet, um, but I also am a nurse that works as a psychiatric hospital in Hartford with adolescents. And so I'm very familiar with the topic of bullying. And I think that finding a way for adolescents to tell their own story or to have stories is a better way to reach them sometimes. We hope to talk more about that. And with you is Jack. Well, yes, it's Jack Singer, but actually my full name is Larry Singer. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the Larry Jack Singer, or L. Jack Singer, but it's part of my poet's name. Mm -hmm. I like the independence of Jack Kerouac uh, and expressing his, uh, uh, his animus mm -hmm. to uh, whatever surrounded him. And I express my animus through poetry, such as uh, bullying, mm -hmm. such as teen, su teen suicide, uh, and certainly drug addiction and, and some of the pitfalls that, that are before uh, the youth of our, of our nation. Not necessarily just the youth, but uh, starting there. And I, I'd like to be able to um, put an oar in the water to try to row our way through this kind of a mess. And uh, in whatever way I can be helpful, uh, I'm volunteering that service. Out Loud hopes to do that with many topics, and tonight we are focusing on bullying. So let's begin with a song called Break the Chain, tonight's topic. Down the halls is your average scene. She's standing there, she's always there, and she's just taking it. You look at her, she looks at you, she seems to beg you with her eyes. It's all you can do not to look away. Break the chain, show her you care, show you won't lie. Show her she's perfect, tell her not to cry. Show her you just realize. Break the chain. That was from StopBullying.gov. They put together several public service announcements. We picked this one because it was a song and it was the closest thing to a poem. There are some limits to it and some positive things about the message. Would you care to comment, Jen, on uh, what I know you believe is a limit to this yeah. message? Well, I think that it doesn't capture some of the diversity of the students, um, just in the images. Um, I think also it doesn't really get to the depth of the stress that it can cause someone. Mm -hmm. As a nurse who works on an inpatient psychiatric unit, I've worked with many children who've been bullied and who have had thoughts of suicide, self-harm. Um, because of this, their self-esteem is very damaged. Uh, I've seen some teens over and over again, um, and that is one of the reasons why they are there. Um, Cyberbullying, their self-esteem is destroyed by other kids. Um, they feel alone, and I think they do need a voice um, I, the big thing that uh, we were just talking about was dialogue. It's difficult for people to start a conversation about uh, when you're not feeling happy, who do you talk to? Very hard for teens to trust people. I think that uh, breaking the chain of silence is that you're not worth uh, expressing your opinion. You've been told that. You just sit there and take it. I think that's a sad, sad, sad circumstance. Uh, and I think that given the opportunity and given the, the means of, uh, of, of presenting their, uh, uh, their feelings, uh, no matter how 
unpolished they might be, at least invite that dialogue, uh, at least that, invite that monologue, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, eventually you'll, you'll be sharing uh, with more than one uh, the experiences of more than one that you're not alone in these, in these circumstances. Uh, there's bullies all over the place and there are victims all over the place. And the only way to uh, stop that uh, circumstance and the, and the negative effects that it can have on individuals who are susceptible to bullying uh, is to know that they do have a voice and, uh, and invite that voice to be, be shared. One of the other concepts within Break the Chain is that when young people see it happening, that they, as observers, can stop letting it happen to someone they know and be, befriend them. Based on your comments about the voice, we do have a clip here that is a kind of a collaboration between a young poet in our own community and um, some young videographers. They put, to, put it together as a story, uh, again, to encourage people to stop bullying. So we'll look at the next clip. Discrimination. A word grown from the seeds of hatred, watered with ignorance and loathing, rising in gnarled, twisted vines that sprout up into a blackened sky, as its roots sink like claws into naive victims, whose ignorance does not bring them bliss, but revulsion, at anything that stands out from their rotten rose garden. They stand upon false pedestals, preaching pitiful poems of prejudice, spewing subliminal stories of sinister plots behind a beautiful veil of deadly deceptions they kill with their words. Tearing families apart with carbon-copied molds children can no longer fit in. Names, terms, designations, those that determine whether you can sit in the front with the squeaky clean or are pushed to the torn holy seats in the back. Whether you stand up and walk out, or allow yourself to be consumed by the deception and drown in the tears of, if only I had spoken up. If only you had spoken up. Maybe that girl your friend called a whale would be alive. She sank in her sadness, because she was not a whale. She was a person, and now she's gone. If only you had spoken up. Maybe the boy whose skin resembled coffee instead of the creamer they shoved down our throats wouldn't leave school with the taste of sour milk in his mouth as clouds of offensive smog block his vision of those who really love him. If only you had spoken up. Maybe the little boy who wants to wear a tutu wouldn't fear the forces of foreign phrases like fag trapping him in a dark cage of stereotypes and loneliness. If only you had spoken up. Maybe the girl wrapped up in tight cloth would be seen as human instead of a threat to national security. If only you had spoken up. If only. You have the power to change. So stand up, speak out, and change. There was a redundant use of if only, if only, if only, and it spoke sometimes to the person that was holding in that feeling mm -hmm. and sometimes to that person who was the observer. And both of those are part of Break the Chain. The person who wants to have the, needs to have their own voice and the person that has to consider having the voice for someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything that s jumped out at you? Yeah, that, that's an after the fact kind of a phrase, mm -hmm. if only. Mm -hmm. That is, I'm more into, the, into uh, dialogues that, that invite uh, things to be prevented uh, and to, to see the potential of preventing some of these circumstances. Mm -hmm. But if only I had done such and so, I mean, that's too late. Uh, that doesn't anticipate the, uh, well, you know what the, the outcome most likely is going to be if you don't say something about it. One of it. them was mentioned, that the whale, the suicide. You see something, you say something, yeah. and you yeah. do something. And uh, if you have the, the wherewithal and the mechanism before you, and you do have the mechanism before you, you have a voice. And there are, you, there are ears in the community that will listen to what you have to say. Uh, no matter what your peer group may think about you, you have a voice and you have an obligation, I think. I, I kind of actually had a different take on it. I actually really liked this one with the if only, especially for teenagers or kids. It's actually going to make them realize that there's a big consequence to them not speaking up. Sometimes 
at that age, you're not thinking about the consequences of anything. You're not thinking about that. You're not focusing in on this. This kind of, I think, brings it really clear, like there are major consequences if you don't speak up. I think they gave a lot of different examples to kind of get a lot of people thinking, oh, that could have been the person that I had an interaction with. So I really thought that was really helpful so a lot of people could relate to different scenarios they presented. But I thought it was very effective and I liked the strong tone that made it seem like this is important, pay attention. So I liked it. Great. I, I, I agree with both points of view. Yeah. Um, and part of it is an intergenerational view of, of the problem mm -hmm. and the solutions and the approach. And there's one young man that I met. He's no longer young. Uh, his name is Shane Cozane, and he'll be joining us virtually mm -hmm. through his poetry. He actually started, to this day, a foundation to work on this issue around 2013. He actually was in Wallingford in 2000 and shared his words here. And so it was exciting uh, to see him take his work and his words to the next level. Mm -hmm. So let's do the introduction to Shane in the next video clip. I hid my heart under the bed because my mother said, if you're not careful, someday someone's going to break it. Take it from me, under the bed is not a good hiding spot. I know because I've been shot down so many times, I get altitude sickness just from standing up for myself. But that's what we were told. Stand up for yourself. And that's hard to do if you don't know who you are. We were expected to define ourselves at such an early age. And if we didn't do it, others did it for us. Geek, fatty, slut, fag. And at the same time we were being told what we were, we were being asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? I always thought that was an unfair question. It presupposes that we can't be what we were already are. We were kids. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a man. I wanted a registered retirement savings plan that would keep me in candy long enough to make old age sweet. When I was a kid, I wanted to shave. Now, not so much. <laughs> when I was eight, I wanted to be a marine biologist. When I was nine, I saw the movie Jaws and thought to myself, no thank you. <laughs> when I was 10, I was told that my parents left because they didn't want me. When I was 11, I wanted to be left alone. When I was 12, I wanted to die. When I was 13, I wanted to kill a kid. When I was 14, I was asked to seriously consider a career path. I said, I'd like to be a writer. And they said, choose something realistic. So I said, professional wrestler. And they said, don't be stupid. See, they asked me what I wanted to be, then told me what not to be. And I wasn't the only one. We were being told that we somehow must become what we are not, sacrificing what we are to inherit the masquerade of what we will be. I was being told to accept the identity that others will give me. And I wonder, what made my dreams so easy to dismiss? Granted, my dreams are shy, because they're Canadian. <laughs> my dreams are self-conscious and overly apologetic. They're standing alone at the high school dance, and they've never been kissed. See, my dreams got called names, too. Silly, foolish, impossible. But I kept dreaming. I was going to be a wrestler. I had it all figured out. I was going to be the garbage man. My finishing move was going to be the trash compactor. My saying was going to be, I'm taking out the trash. And then this guy, Duke the Dumpster Drossy, stole my entire shtick. I was crushed as if by a trash compactor. <laughs> I thought to myself, what now? Where do I turn? Poetry. <laughs> like a boomerang, the thing I loved came back to me. One of the first lines of poetry I can remember writing was in response to a world that demanded I hate myself. From age 15 to 18, I hated myself for becoming the thing that I loathed, a bully. When I was 19, I wrote, I will love myself despite the ease with which I lean toward the opposite. Standing up for yourself doesn't have to mean embracing violence. When I was a kid, I traded in homework assignments for friendship, then gave each friend a late slip for never showing up on time, and in most cases, not at all. 
I gave myself a hall pass to get through each broken promise. And I remember this plan born out of frustration from a kid who kept calling me Yogi, then pointed to my tummy and said, too many picnic baskets. Turns out it's not that hard to trick someone. And one day before class, I said, yeah, you can copy my homework. And I gave him all the wrong answers that I'd written down the night before. He got his paper back expecting a near-perfect score and couldn't believe it when he looked across the room at me and held up a zero. I knew I didn't have to hold up my paper of 28 out of 30, but my satisfaction was complete when he looked at me puzzled and I thought to myself, smarter than the average bear. Mother was that a poem? Was that a story? What was that introduction to you? Well, that's a trip through reality that's finally uh, uh, come to, to rest mm -hmm. uh, that he's actually proud of. And the journey, uh, though hard and sometimes fragmented, eventually had a, a positive outcome. And he could see the, the uh, frailties and, the, and the, uh, uh, his ability to rise above and to cope. Uh, many people don't feel that they have the ability to cope and that they just have to absorb, absorb, and don't not cope. Let, each absorption seems to diminish the, the, uh, uh, the body. Mm -hmm. uh, so I liked that his approach to that. At least that's the message that I, that I got from it. He expressed this storytelling first and then goes into the poem, which I'd like to share now, and then we can comment on that. When I was a kid, I used to think that pork chops and karate chops were the same thing. I thought they were both pork chops. And because my grandmother thought it was cute and because they were my favorite, she let me keep doing it. Not really a big deal. One day, before I realized fat kids are not designed to climb trees, I fell out of a tree and bruised the right side of my body. I didn't want to tell my grandmother about it because I was scared I'd get in trouble for playing somewhere I shouldn't have been. A few days later, the gym teacher noticed the bruise and I got sent to the principal's office. From there, I was sent to another small room with a really nice lady who asked me all kinds of questions about my life at home. I saw no reason to lie. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty good. I told her whenever I'm sad, my grandmother gives me karate chops. This led to a full-scale investigation and I was removed from the house for three days until they finally decided to ask how I got the bruises. News of this silly little story quickly spread through the school and I earned my first nickname, Pork Chop. To this day, I hate pork chops. I'm not the only kid who grew up this way. Surrounded by people who used to say that rhyme about sticks and stones. As if broken bones hurt more than the names we got called, and we got called them all. So we grew up believing no one would ever fall in love with us. That we'd be lonely forever. That we'd never meet someone to make us feel like the sun was something they built for us in their tool shed. So broken heartstrings bled the blues as we tried to empty ourselves so we would feel nothing. Don't tell me that hurts less than a broken bone. That an ingrown life is something surgeons can cut away. That there's no way for it to metastasize, it does. She was eight years old. Our first day of grade three when she got called ugly. We both got moved to the back of class so we would stop getting bombarded by spitballs. But the school halls were a battleground where we found ourselves outnumbered day after wretched day. We used to stay inside for recess because outside was worse. Outside, we'd have to rehearse running away or learn to stay still like statues, giving no clues that we were there in grade five. They tipped a sign at the front of her desk that read, Beware of dog. To this day, despite a loving husband, she doesn't think she's beautiful because of a birthmark that takes up a little less than half her face. Kids used to say she looks like a wrong answer that someone tried to erase but couldn't quite get the job done and they'll never understand that she's raising two kids whose definition of beauty begins with the word mom because they see her heart before they see her skin because she's only ever always been amazing. He was a broken branch grafted onto a different family tree, adopted, not because his parents opted for a different destiny. He was three when he became a mixed drink of one part left alone and two parts tragedy. 
Started therapy in eighth grade. Had a personality made up of tests and pills. Lived like the uphills were mountains and the downhills were cliffs. Four fifth suicidal, a tidal wave of antidepressants and an adolescence of being called pauper. One part because of the pills, 99 parts because of the cruelty. He tried to kill himself in grade 10 when a kid who could still go home to mom and dad had the audacity to tell him, get over it. As if depression is something that can be remedied by any of the contents found in a first aid kit. To this day, he is a stick of TNT lit from both ends. Could describe to in detail the way the sky bends and the moments before it's about to fall. And despite an army of friends who all call him an inspiration, he remains a conversation piece between people who can't understand. Sometimes being drug free has less to do with addiction and more to do with sanity. We weren't the only kids who grew up this way. To this day, kids are still being called names. The classics were, hey stupid, hey spaz. Seems like every school has an arsenal of names getting updated every year. And if a kid breaks in a school and no one around chooses to hear, do they make a sound? Are they just background noise from a soundtrack stuck on repeat when people say things like kids can be cruel? Every school was a big top circus tent And the pecking order went from acrobats to lion tamers From clowns to carnies All of these miles ahead of who we were, we were freaks Lobster claw boys and bearded ladies Oddities juggling depression and loneliness Playing solitaire, spitting the bottle Trying to kiss the wounded parts of ourselves and heal But at night, while the others slept We kept walking the tightrope It was practice, and yes, some of us fell But I want to tell them that all of this is just debris left over when we finally decide to smash all the things we thought we used to be and if you can't see anything beautiful about yourself get a better mirror look a little closer stare a little longer because there's something inside you that made you keep trying despite everyone who told you to quit you built a cast around your broken heart and signed it yourself you signed it they were wrong because maybe you didn't belong to a group or a clique Maybe they decided to pick you last for basketball or everything. Maybe you used to bring bruises and broken teeth to show and tell but never told. Because how can you hold your ground if everyone around you wants to bury you beneath it? You have to believe that they were wrong. They have to be wrong. Why else would we still be here? We grew up learning to cheer on the underdog because we see ourselves in them. We stem from a root planted in the belief that we are not what we were called. We are not abandoned cars stalled out and sitting empty on some highway. And if in some way we are, don't worry. We only got out to walk and get gas. We are graduating members from the class of we made it. Not the faded echoes of voices crying out names will never hurt me. Of course, they did. But our lives will only ever always continue to be a balancing act that has less to do with pain and more to do with beauty. That was full. Mm -hmm. That was full of so many one-liners mm -hmm. and many of those expressions that I started the show with were in response to that poem, but I want to share one expression from a boy that was in sixth grade, and this was shared with his class, and he said most kids laughed as they watched it, um, and he was just staring at the screen, and tears were dripping down his face, and he felt like someone understood him when he listened to this poem. Then he realized that they were supposed to talk about the poem after the class and discuss what does it feel like to be bullied and why do we bully. He said, I'm 5'7", I'm 11, I get all A's. I've been called a skyscraper, a nerd, a geek, teacher's pet, a freak. I've been physically bullied. It was a difficult thing to go through this after listening to the poem, but after class, he went to the park with a friend, and when they got there, there were a lot of kids from school. And uh, the kid was a little nervous, and he saw the rudest kid in his class approach him. 
And as he approached him, he said, I'm sorry. And the nerd, the geek, the skyscraper was now a human and he didn't know what to say. His heart nearly stopped, he said. I don't know how things are going to be on Monday, was his feeling, but he wanted to let the poet know that in seeing this video in class, that he felt whole and he wanted to say thank you. These are the kinds of stories mm -hmm. that to this day has uh, invoked on the internet, mm -hmm. just as one of many. That's what kids need. They need to see that somebody else has made it through and, and have a chance to talk about it. I think as much too, the, in the story that you just told was that the bully had a chance to, to apologize, felt like there was an opportunity to take back their own behavior because there's as much shame in that too and reasons why people do that. But I think it's very, very effective um, and I think it's a good thing. But I, I think that you said or in what um, this young man was writing was that people were initially, the other kids were laughing at mm -hmm. the video. And, you know, it just shows that it's a difficult topic that's why I think the first video clip of Shane, where all the humor was there, sometimes makes it easier for people to handle a topic like this. So people need to hear it different ways. But both of his ways were very effective. Healing takes place in, on both sides of that divide, and it, if given an opportunity to be uh, expressed. Uh, and I think poetry, or at least just casual conversation sometimes, is enough to elicit that response. You don't share for that ultimate apology, but you just share because you share. Breaking the chain is You're to get the, the voice chain. out and also yeah. to stop it as an observer or as a participant. It's sad to think that we live in a time when the word bullying is too weak to describe the kinds of abuse people face these days. My experience with violence in school still echo throughout my life, but standing to face the problem has helped me in immeasurable ways. For the profound and lasting impact that bullying can have on an individual, schools and families are in desperate need of proper tools to confront this problem. We can give them a starting point, a message that will have a far-reaching and long-lasting effect in confronting bullying. What a volunteer effort will demonstrate what a community of caring individuals are capable of when they come together. We hope to return to Out Loud um, for the same reason that Shane put to the Stay Together, to establish in some way that poems can help, inclusiveness in the community can help, uh, and there are, are resources out there uh, to not feel alone. I, I think anyway that that dialogue uh, is, uh, is an imperative, but I think you have to have a dialogue with yourself uh, and you have to feel that you're worthy to talk to yourself and assess yourself and feel good about yourself. Maybe that's Pollyanna-ish uh, in, a, in a world today where you're told you're not worth uh, that effort mm -hmm. and just sit back and take it. And I, I think that's disastrous and I think that is counterproductive, obviously, for that reason. That dialogue with self, that can be done through poetry or journaling or just Mm -hmm. writing and eventually some of those things may be the one or two poems that the individual person is able to have because uh, as we said in the beginning everyone is not a poet but everyone has a poem within mm -hmm. and on that note I'd like to thank you all for joining us at Out Loud we look forward to discussing topics with you such as addiction uh, school to prison breaking that chain as well, possibly gun violence. We're going to let you pick the topic, and we're going to reach out to you to help us find the poems that can speak to you out loud.